but they take sophisticated research and put it into those cute little pictures, and it actually ends up being a lie. The research didn't really say that. They simplified it so much. You know, it's, uh, well, it's <laughs> a television news director at WGN in Chicago, who, uh, uh, with whom I'm on a couple of boards of directors, says, you know, that it's the, it's the medium for those who find television news too taxing. <laughs> That's his description of it. But, whether you and I like it or not, there is a message there. There is a message there. And this is a message. One, two, three, A, B, C. Lay it out. Don't give them a chance to misunderstand. Just put it right over. Next point. Big picture. Nobody wants to come to the next alumni meeting because the school needs it. But if you can show that it will help mankind in far off Timbuktu and meanwhile make the faculty better in some great big picture issue, they'll probably show up. Okay? One of our clients was who was very active in minority communities was going to do a nice event in St. Louis, focused on the St. Louis black community. This happened to be their relationships with the black community. But no, we couldn't do that, focus on that. Hell no, we had to have a Nelson Mandela birthday party. Okay? Because that was the only thing that was big picture enough to get anybody to care and come. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about. You want to see some big picture communications? Hey, look at this. That's a news release. See that? It's from Hardy's. We get these all the time at PR Reporter, don't we, Regina? I mean, this, this is Hardy's limited engagement grapevine tour in 88. Okay? And when you open it up inside here, there's a little thing full of California raisins. As you can see, our ever present staff made all the damn raisins. <laughs> I got any? But I mean, there it is, you see? Now, here's the, here's, the, here's the news release, you see, right here. Okay? But I mean, meanwhile, I'm eating raisins. So already, I suppose, psychologically, I feel better about the news release. A little sugar going to my brain and all. See, there's a great big picture, and here's this thing to package it in. That's peanuts. I mean, one computer manufacturer delivered all their news releases in person with a cake. <laughs> People came in, they called on the editors, and they brought in this birthday cake. Said, our company is five years old, and we want you to share this with us. And they cut the old cake. You know, and they claimed that they had great success with this, and of course we didn't believe it for a minute. So we called up some of the editors, and a couple of them said, boy, that really was good cake. <laughs> and another one said, we said, would you have printed this release if they had just sent it to you in the mail? Was this, you know, if it, assuming it was good information for your particular audience. And about half of them said, hell no. But after I ate that cake and all, I mean, I put it right on the computer, and it went. It's a big picture. You see, none of this little news release in the mail. They get zillions of those. You've got to deliver it with a cake and candles and that whole silly bit. Okay? How about those of you who are nonprofits? If you publish some kind of a publication, does it carry ads? Well, I don't know why you're so slow. The MS organization and their national publication starting. Three months ago now, sells ads. One of the big beer companies wanted to get in, and they had a hell of a fight with the board of directors until somebody reminded them that beer didn't cause MS, and they're damn right they took the ad. <laughs> Thinking a lot of MS people were beer drinkers. Why not? Stop to think about it. Stop to think about the blurry. Hey, listen, Campbell Soup Company has cut a deal with the Catholic bishops of the United States. For five weeks in Lent, any parish that wishes can run five ads from Campbell Soup on soups that are okay to eat during Lent. In Phoenix, no, in Tucson, Arizona, I, I talked to the, a business group down there a couple of months ago, and I, I, I actually got a parking place near the convention center, and I walk over and park my car, put my money in the meter, holy Moses, across the top, you know how the parking meters are made, across the top it says buy a Jeep. Buy a Jeep, <laughs> There are now six companies selling advertising or message space in toilet stalls. I talked to the owner of one who showed up at a presentation of mine in Nashville, Tennessee. He said, 
the only thing holding him back was that he was just he just couldn't get out and find any more buildings, you know, because every time he went into a building, the management said, You bet right now, how much? Give me that money. Okay? <laughs> See what we're up against? See? I mean it's it is a different picture. Now let's go back and talk about these publications that we've always done in this new environment. We are reported did a study not long ago of quarterlies. Quarterlies were becoming a big deal because people felt one way to cut back was not do them every month and do a quarterly. We could not find one quarter that came out four times a year. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. A quarterly is kind of a nice thing. You know, it has that ring to it, but it's a quarterly. But we put them out when they have to get around to it and have the money. Okay, now, you know what? There is nothing wrong with that. That is sound strategic thinking. Put it out when you have something to say, and please leave me alone the other two quarters. More and more quarterlies have an annual report as one of the four. Some kind of a view book kind of issue, you know, what is the company all about? Capabilities brochure as another one of the four. And two issues. And two issues. How about newsletters? You do a monthly, right? And oh, you start getting that awful feeling. You just start to get over the deadline. It's not like that. That's stupid. Unless you have something to say that fits these criteria, please don't publish. And then do a little study. And you tell me if anybody noticed. Because the chances are there won't be many. They have trouble finding it in the pile. When they call you up and say, what was in last week's issue? Say, oh, I'm not telling you. Find your copy and read it. Of course, there wasn't any, but that's the <laughs> problem. Not yours, right? The best newsletter that I have ever seen is published by a school district in Upper New York State. It is one sheet of paper. Now, it's a big sheet. I'm no, serious. It's a big sheet like this so that they can't get lost in a pile. See? And, and, and no matter, it's the size of no matter how you fold it, it won't come out to 8 and a half by 11 or stuck, stick in the pot. It's done always in a very bright color, a bright blue, a red, something like that. Okay? The type is huge, and they have a rule. They have a rule, only publish it when there's something really to be said, that really is need to know, and no more than four topics to an issue. If they run four topics and it doesn't take the rest of the second page, they just stop. That's the deal they cut with their, it's an internal publication, that's the deal they cut with their audience. And they announce that right up front big. And when that thing comes out and they do studies on it, within two hours, 90% of the people in the place have looked at all four of those issues. Okay? Show me some research that will touch that. There aren't any, because we have too many pages. It's too routine. Oh, here's the next issue, huh? I'm really glad. I'm so excited, you know, more reading. Okay? Now, I talked about focused appeals. Maybe the biggest part of focused appeals is the number of topics that people are trying to shove down audiences' throats. We can get some good advice, some good advice from other professions. How about the trial lawyer's rule? Never, never, never make more than three points to an off to a jury. That's the trial lawyer's rule. Eh? That's the first thing they learn in, in law school. The jury can't remember more than three points. Then they get all confused and they start nitpicking, and your client goes off to the Husqvar where he can't pay your bills. So now let's get first things first. Okay? <laughs> How about the congressman's rule? Never vote yes on anything that cannot be explained in two minutes or less. It's a congressman's rule. You just ask anybody on Capitol Hill. They all know it by heart. It's the first thing you learn when you get elected. They're telling us something. I hope we're listening, but I, I'm not awfully hopeful. How about a little show and tell? Here's the news magazines. Now, if anybody in this country studies the effects of these things, it's the news magazines, because their life depends on it. You understand, though, that they're very hard-headed. The reason they start asking you to renew your subscription the week after it starts <laughs> is because they know that in the period of a year, if you read four issues cover to cover, that's about average. 
Okay. But still, they know, so they're doing everything they can. This is an issue from last year. It has to be U.S. News World Report. They all copy one another. It doesn't matter. Look at the content. It's page. It's one page. You see right over here. They're giving merits a chance, you know, to corrupt us all and kill us with lung cancer. Anybody with the tobacco institute? Okay. <laughs> See? That's it. Okay? Now look at Time Magazine by the end of the year. The whole Time Magazine, let's see, a little truth in advertising here, just to let you know, this really is Time Magazine, okay? The contents page, my friends. Now that's valuable advertising space to give up, I suggest to you. Maybe the best placement in the whole damn publication. Why did they do it? Because I mean, their studies show that if you can get them this far and catch them, you might lure them the rest of the way. And if you can't, it's another issue on the to be read pile, meaning ultimately or soon to be shredded. Okay? A lot of people thought, well, we can't get people to pay attention to too many communications in a publication form. So what we'll do is we'll lump them all together and we'll go to this quarterly idea. These big magazines. Raytheon had one of the absolute best. Some of you probably saw it. Raytheon magazine. I mean, it, it lived up to most all of the rules. It touted Raytheon stuff every time it really gave you a Raytheon message. They dropped it. Couldn't show that it was doing any good. You couldn't afford it. Gulf and Western did the same thing in a little lighter mode. Now another company that does not wish to be identified because they're a little embarrassed about it, also published one of those. And when they were considering whether to continue after they heard that, well actually it was 13 big companies quit within about a two month period. And after this other company heard that this had happened, they asked themselves the questions, what are the real values of our, our really expensive publication? Those of you in, in hospitals and in, in educational institutions know you put out these super duper things. Okay, what's the value of that? And when they, they really look at the body of knowledge, you know what they find? The number one value is the cover. If it looks like $68 million, it just kind of, you know, you say, The trouble is, when they did studies of how many cracked the cover, very few. So what did they do? Oh, you know how enterprising people in our field are. This guy did an issue with a cover and nothing inside. <laughs> Sent it out to 500 randomly selected from his list. Got six calls. Six people called back to say, hey, you know, I, something must have gone wrong. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then, then, then he said, boy, he says, his, his, he was really shaking his boots because he was afraid they were going to say, I'd really like to read it, send me the issue. <laughs> but the evidence is overwhelming that there is a place for publications to just build your reputation up to this. Holy Moses! <laughs> but boy, you had better have a big buck budget. And you better have a lane working for you, you better have the best photographers working for you, because if you can't get with that, it isn't going to do the job. It's just going to be big. And big means more reading, which means pitching. Now, ask yourself this question. If you publish a, a, anything that could be called a magazine, a newsletter, a, a monthly, that all fits under the generic term magazine. What is a magazine? What's the etymology of that word? doesn't mean you got to put out a big, thick issue every month. The magazine, remember, is a military term. It's the old powder magazine. It's where you keep all the powder together in one place. So all it means is it's a collection of stuff. A lot of people now are starting to think of a magazine exactly that way. It's a collection of stuff. We don't have to send it all out at one time. We don't have to send it all to the same audience. We're going to ticket and target, and we do it item by item. Somebody may get the whole thing. We got list A, which gets the whole shoot match. That's maybe the internal audience. We got list B, which gets a reprint. That's all they cared about in that issue. We know it. It's one article. So in order to get them to read the article, that's all we send them. Because if we send it wrapped in the package, they won't read it. They may not get to it. Okay? And instead of shooting it all at once, we may feed it out slowly over time. Or how about two of the greatest 
communication phenomena in recent history. First of all, the Ayatollah's taking of Iran, and secondly, solidarity surviving in the Polish factories. You know how both of them did that? With the audio cassette. The audio cassette. The Ayatollah from his headquarters near Paris had airplanes, little private planes, dropping audio cassettes all over Iran. And the Shah's troops and police and everybody else couldn't stop it. Even in Iran, everybody, of course, has a Japanese tape recorder, right? And they could play the tape and pass it along, and pass it along. Solidarity. When it was barricaded inside the Gdansk steel mills and shipyard, had one machine that they had gotten hold of, which could make 1,200 tapes a day. And every day it made 1,200. We learned about this because they got a message through somehow to the company that made the machines. Because they were deathly afraid the machine would break. And they'd be out of business. No other way of communicating. That's a magazine. It's giving the information to those people who want it and need it in a form that's reader or hearer friendly. And it's not the old idea that, hey, I put out publications. Well, I could tell you how to do a neat readership study if we had time. I'll tell you quickly how to do a neat readership study, okay? Do not ask the old typical questions. Do you read, check every issue, most every issue, some issues, you know, do you read it all, a little, forget all that. They might only care. No. <laughs> you lie when people send those to you because you feel kind of guilty. You know, they went to all this trouble to send it to you and you didn't read it. And instead, you ask them one or two questions about the content of material that has appeared within the last six months. Answer it, or they can't. And if they can, you can be very sure they didn't read it. Now, you still can't be sure they did read it if they can answer. Because of course somebody else may have told them about it. So it's perfectly legitimate then when they can identify the material to say, gee, where did you learn that? And don't be surprised if 25 or 30 percent come back and say, well, you know, my sister told me. Or I heard it on the grapevine. But that's not the point. You got it out there. You got it into the grapevine and you got some people to, to attend to it. That's the beginning of wisdom. Well, now let's take a look at what some of our own members are doing. I hope I don't embarrass anybody. Melanie took the plunge. You all got a copy of Titans, I think. Everybody in the chapter, anyway. All right, now let's see if Melanie's on the right track. Okay? First of all, look at, this, look at the size. It's big enough to be impressive. See, if it was a little bitty thing like this, going this way, it would say that the Diocese of Manchester is a little bitty thing. And down at the powerhouse, they would, the bishop wouldn't like that. So it's that way, it's not what they, that's the power, don't they still, Phil Kenny always used to call it the power house, I assume that was, actually that came from Bennett Surf, I don't know, you know where the, where the Helmsley Palace Hotel is in New York, you know where, where Leona is, where she is an endurance vial, you know, or in the courthouse or wherever she is, well, that building, that was, it was a, it was a famous mansion. One time that was split in two. There, on this half here was Random House Publishers in Bennett Surf, and on the other side was the Archbishop Cardinal, usually, of the New York Diocese. And Bennett always called it, you know, his office. He used to say, a Random House, the powerhouse. <laughs> so much that people ask him, he'd always say, well, that guy over there in the red hat. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, take a look at this. Now, you know, you and I could tell her how her writing is good, and we found three misspellings, and the pictures could be clearer. But the question is, has anybody in the diocese been doing anything to get these messages up and to tell people you are one community? I have a hunch they haven't, or they probably put the money into this. But the best thing of all, and boy, this is a message. I hope you'll keep this up now. I mean, a little letter came along to introduce it. See, she didn't count on that. She knows they're not going to read that, but she thought they might read the letter. The letter tells what the purposes are of this publication. It promotes the publication. If you have any publication, no matter how simple, if you don't promote it, don't expect it to be very successful. You know how when you run a television show, you'd think when Herb Schmerz used to spend all that money on a petroleum broadcasting network that all he had to do was just turn on the, the machine, right? Just let it go on air. Do you know that he spent as many dollars promoting the shows as he did producing the shows. Never forget old Herb. Well, I think there's a lesson in that. Today we find that even internal newsletters need to be promoted 
If it's coming out on Monday, there need to be stickers all over. It says, read about Joan Blow or whatever, just like the newspapers do. Don't kid ourselves that people are going to read it otherwise. Now, here's one that Dick has plugged in and the society, actually the Trust for New Hampshire Lands, run by the society. Notice again, see, it's all big stuff today. But it ain't big stuff. It says you're a big key organization in most cases. There may be a strategy otherwise, okay? A lot of nice artwork, great big pictures, see? Catch it up. You know, ordinarily we'd have had 18 pictures out here, wouldn't we? 14 headlines, gotta get it all in. <laughs> you go back in here, first thing you know, he's taking the state and he's dividing it all up. See, he's got a little map over here, because of which part of the state. I don't give a damn about Belknap County, so I took right over that, it's perfectly okay. See, he's guiding me down to my part of the state where I can give him a behavioral response. Some strategy of those, not just publications. Well, let me show you the, the real skinny here. Then I'll show you some examples that you won't believe, then we'll go on. Can a publication succeed in this world? Well, Harold Mendelssohn has to be one of the four or five great researchers on communication effects. What can we expect from communications and what can we? Here's his three rules of how publications can succeed. First, assume, I'll put it in my own language, okay, because he speaks in, you know, academic jargon. Assume publics do not give a damn. Just assume the people you're sending it to, even though you spend all this time super targeting and find out they care, nonetheless start off assuming that at the moment they received that baby, they could care less. Because it's probably true. Even if they're totally interested, well, let me, you answer the question. The publications you get that you're really interested in, how many of them do you nonetheless put aside to read later? <laughs> but everything, right? Because when it comes, you're busy. You're doing something else. And once it's put aside to read later, <laughs> see you later, baby. It's the shredder or the incinerator for you. 99 times out of 100. Okay, so assume they aren't interested. Meaning, you had better grab them. It's a direct mail rule. It has to impart its message between the mailbox and the wastebasket. Never forget that. It, it, in that one movement of taking it out of the box and throwing it right in the basket, it has to communicate. Okay. Secondly, set very specific very reasonable goals do not expect a heck of a lot. And therefore, you can get that. And if you target your audience or you're not throwing a ton of money at it and wasting it on a lot of people who don't appreciate your brilliant Shakespearean prose, your brilliant Shakespearean one, two, three ABCs. <laughs> okay, notice now, this is a guy who more than any other has studied what can it really do. Thirdly, Delineate your target audiences as never before. And of course, he, he lists demographic delineation, psychological attributes, lifestyles, vows, as we heard about before, value and belief systems, and their behavior habits around the product, service, or organization that you're involved in. So if you're dealing with an alumni organization, you might very well target those whose habit is to participate. And as many alumni groups are finding, the other 90%, forget it, forget it. Let me show you what's working out there. If you want to know what's working in communication, my belief is you immediately go to direct mail. Because the direct mail people are the ones who have to overcome everything we've written up here and still get a behavioral response. Now, don't model yourself on that. Because remember, they only need a 2% response to make it. If only 2% of your audience is using your publication, you're, not, you're just not going to make it. Your, your organization is going to throw it out. But nonetheless, for guidelines, so what's happening now? Well, number one, see this? This envelope violates the U.S. postal laws and regulations. See, because the address is way up there at the top. And the whole cover is a Doonesbury cartoon. It just shows this is a nonprofit organization. It just shows how far they had to go, you see, to get the message out between the mailbox and the basket. But if you saw Doonesbury, 
you'd probably stop, wouldn't you? We, and the message is right here, and hopefully it gets you then to open it. It got me to open it. That's one example. Let me just go away from Greg Dale for a minute and show you two other real behavioral communication devices. This is what works today. See this? See that little thing? Believe it or not, that is the United States Air Force's official procedures for the release of information to media, politicians, and the public. A lieutenant colonel that I work with out at the Defense Information School got tired of the 239-page binder that previously contained all this. <laughs> Typical government, it's a true story. I mean, here it is, it's true. You know, what this tells you, you, say you're the public affairs officer on duty at Eglin Air Force Base, and you have an incident on the runway, and a plane skids off, or some young airman gets in a bad 